As an industrial water treater, you have to do so much. You have to know about so many things. Chemistry, physics, environmental, electrical, and the list goes on. But did you ever think that list should include cyber protection? Who's got time for that? Well, hackers have plenty of time to find your vulnerabilities and hold your valuable information hostage. 43% of all cyber attacks happen to small businesses. Small businesses are not prepared to defend against cyber attacks. The cyber threat protection experts at Reinert Consulting Group have been helping water treatment companies with strategies to protect their valuable data. Here's the thing about Reinert Consulting Group. They understand what water treatment companies need to defend against these attacks. From training to software, Reiner Consulting Group is your one-stop shop for protecting your valuable data. After all, where would you be without your data? Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash cyber to find out more. That's scalinguph2o.com forward slash cyber. Don't wait before it's too late. Welcome to Scaling Up H2O, the podcast where we scale up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. I'm Trace Blackmore, the host of Scaling Up H2O, and I'm also Trace Blackmore, certified water technologist. And I know there's so many people out there that are thinking about getting their certified water technologist designation, but oh my goodness, I've got to sign up to take that examination. And folks, I know that is stressful. I also know there are so many other people out there that could be CWTs, but they lack the confidence to sign up for the exam. So if I am talking to you, I've got something for you. And that is go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash academy. That once again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash academy. And you'll see that we are starting to put out some of the best water treatment training classes in the industry. I love water treatment training. And it's always been a dream of mine to be able to do training at a larger scale and allow people to get trained on their own terms when they have time to do it. So this is a self-serve when you can do it option. But one of the courses we put out, actually two courses, we put out the CWT practice exam course. Now, this is a confidence building course designed to give you a little taste of what some of the questions may be on your examination and give you some confidence so you can sign up to take the examination. Now, if you go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash academy, you will see we have a free version of this course. Now, this free version is me going through the AWT's explanation of what you have to do to get a CWT. I just simply work straight through the handbook, and they have 10 sample questions in the handbook, and I work through those 10 sample questions with you. So you get a kind of an example of what you're going to get for the paid course. Now, I would love it if you went ahead after that and signed up for the paid course. That is a 100 question examination that my staff wrote to help give you confidence around the CWT exam. It allows you to take the exam and then I work each question for you so you can see how I came up with the correct answer. I also give you tips and tricks on how to logic your way into better answer choices. And then I give you resources so you can learn more about the topics on the questions that you need some help with. All of that is at scalinguph2o.com forward slash academy. I hope you sign up today and I would love to shake your hand the next time I see you and congratulate you on getting your certified water technologist designation. Nation, let's face it, there's so many people out there that do not have clean, readily available resources to just go straight to a faucet and get water. 
And on average, people have to walk six kilometers to go to and bring back water. And it's not even water that many of us would even consider drinking if we had a choice. So folks, there is a global water crisis. And there's so many things that we do in industrial water treatment to conserve water. But here's something that you can do up and above that. On May 20th this year, Team World Vision is having their global 6K. Why is it a 6K? Well, I just told you. It takes the average person to go get water and bring back six kilometers of walking when they don't have that readily available to them. And just think how long it takes to walk six kilometers. Think about the roads that they have to walk on for those six kilometers. So it's taking kids out of school. It's allowing people to get harmed along those roads. Perhaps some even get stolen in the human trade. All these horrible things can happen. And just think, just by having a water supply right there in their village, it so improves so many areas of the quality of their lives. And you can do that by working with Team World Vision. And it's a $50 donation, and that will buy your ticket for the Global 6K. And they can actually bring one person drinking water for that $50. It's amazing what they can do. They really have this down. To find out more about this, you can go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash 6K, and you will find that on May 20th, you can do this 6K from wherever you wish. Now, my company, my team is going to a park and we are all going to celebrate this together. And we're doing this to celebrate, one, that we can do something about this crisis. Two, we are in the water treatment community. And normally, we are just working with our customers and in the capacity of industrial water treatment. Well, this gives us a special day to celebrate being in the industry and work within our team to just celebrate being a team, to work with ourselves and uh, let us know that what we do is so incredibly valuable. So you can join Team Scaling Up by going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash 6K. And also while you're there, if you decide you want to sign up your own team, you can simply click that page and do all of that there as well. Wouldn't it be cool to have your company do the 6K together? Now, maybe you're in a company that you have people all over the world. Well, that's okay. You can still do it together virtually and create hashtags and share all the things that people are doing on May 20th. So I hope you will join me and so many other water treaters in joining in the Global 6K. Again, that's May 20th, scalinguph2o.com forward slash 6K. Nation, also so much going on. We like to tell you about the things that are going on in the water treatment community because maybe there's something close by that you can learn and meet people at. So let's talk about what's going on April 24th through 28th in Washington, D.C. Well, that's Water Week, and this is the goal to bring water treatment professionals together around the country to advocate for federally elected officials and key policymakers to ensure that they understand the importance of having access to safe, reliable, affordable drinking water. So if this is something that interests you, we're going to have all of this information on our show events page. Also, perhaps you are in Shanghai, China, June 5th through 7th. Well, Aquatech China in Shanghai is going to be hosting the Water Quality Associations where they are offering a trade show for where industry professionals come in to see an overview of products and services of the world's leading companies when it comes to water quality. All of this information will be on our show events page. And then the final thing I'll talk about is the 10th International Water Association Membrane Technology Conference. That's going to be in St. Louis, Missouri at Washington University, July 23rd through 26th. Hosted by the International Water Association, this is all about membrane technology. So if this is something that you are in and you want to learn more about, you can go to our show events page and we'll have all of that for you there. 
Nation, as you know, we're always trying to bring technology and new things that you can do at your accounts. So today's interview is all about technology and how you can be there when you're not there. My lab partner today is Justin Nichols of OptConnect. Justin, welcome to the Scale It Up H2O podcast. Hey, Trace. Thanks for having me today. Looking forward to this. Absolutely. Well, you and I met at the AWT convention in Vancouver, Canada. What a great place that was. Yeah, it was awesome. I was there with one of my colleagues. We had a lot of fun. Great venue, great show. It was our first time actually exhibiting at AWT, and we're really excited for Grand Rapids uh, coming up later this year. Awesome. I'm excited about that one as well, and I hear it is going to be very well attended. Yes, uh, I've been hearing that as well. Uh, We had a, a great show last time, so I can only imagine what even more attendance will look like. Well, for the Scaling Up Nation that is just getting to know you, what do you want them to know about Justin Nichols? Yeah, so I work for a company called OpConnect, and I manage our industrial water market. So uh, within OpConnect, we have about 32 different vertical markets that we provide wireless managed services for via cellular uh, my background is in stormwater and wastewater treatment, and I'm kind of applying those 20 plus years of working for OEMs and, and civil engineers and being boots on the ground and, and with this twist of technology, hopefully helping solve some pain points that users may have when they're trying to wirelessly monitor or manage a system. I will say, I truly believe that pretty much everybody is going to move to wirelessly managing their systems, to remotely managing their systems. I know a lot of companies, including ours, will not do water management plans unless we have remote monitoring on there because it takes so long between the time we get testing back and to the time we can actually do something about those test results. So I have no doubt that the entire nation is thinking, how do I get this done? How do I overcome all the objections? Because sooner or later, we're probably going to be on site less because we're going to be able to do so much more remotely. So before we get there, there are some terms that always get thrown out, and I'm not sure if everybody understands them. So these terms are the Internet of Things and machine-to-machine communications. What do we need to know about those? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So the Internet of Things, or IoT, uh, basically encompasses everything now uh, when it comes to remotely monitoring or managing any type of, of equipment. Uh, so really, it's just leveraging different technology that we have available that's that's way more cost effective now to be able to implement really on any type of remote hardware using controllers and sensors. And it really allows us to manage those sites without needing an operator on site or human to human interaction or even human to machine interaction and just leveraging all this technology to be able to do it autonomously, perhaps wirelessly, provide more analytics, uh, more feedback, and, and really allow the end user that's trying to scale a connected solution to be able to do it more efficiently and more cost effectively. When it comes to machine to machine communications, the the acronym is M to M. So you might hear that a lot. This is an M to M connection or M to M hardware. And really what M to M means is it's low data, lower bandwidth types of applications, uh, water treatment controllers being one of them, where yes, we need a connection to the internet to be able to remotely monitor and manage these controllers, but we're not pushing a lot of data back and forth. And so it, it's not high speed video. It's not streaming 4K Netflix where you need speed and bandwidth and, and a lot of those other terms that you might have heard with 5G. It's trying to create a very steady, reliable connection to the internet for lower bandwidth, lower volume data machines like water treatment controllers. So we get that a lot. It's some of the jargon. Uh, IOT, M to M, and yeah, it's it's really simple things, and it can mean a different things to to different people, but that's basically it. One of the biggest issues I think we face as anybody who has a business these days, especially in the water treatment industry, is the shortage of the labor pool, and we're just not finding people to enter the industry like we have in the past. 
And to me, it just makes sense. What do we have to do with the person? What can we do with the machine? With your experience and working with other water treatment companies, what are some of the things that we should just not be doing as industrial water treaters on site and we should get technology to do for us? Yeah, absolutely. I think when we kind of look holistically at the water treatment market, probably only, you know, 20 maybe 30% of controllers out there are getting connected in some capacity to the internet. That could be over cellular, that could be locally via ethernet from the facility or Wi-Fi. And so we have a very low amount uh, when we look at those totals uh, just for internet connectivity compared to what the greater number of controllers are that are out there. And so the more we can leverage this technology and and connect to the internet in, in any capacity that's suitable on site, the less we have to roll trucks. Uh, And so that's kind of generic too across all industries. You have remote equipment that doesn't need a full-time operator. If you're in a service industry and you're rolling trucks, then you're losing money. You know, we're able to leverage technology that can do a lot of that by sitting at a desktop or even accessing that information on your phone, reporting, analytics, such items like that that you don't need to have a physical person on site manually taking these data logs or recording information. And so when we look kind of generally at the market, it's really about maximizing the overhead that you already have. So you're able to, with with your current employee base, not necessarily have to find new people to come in and, and go from site to site, but you're going to be able to monitor and maintain more sites with the same number of, of full-time employees or part-time employees that you might have. With that, you're going to be more cost-effective. Your service contracts potentially are going to be worth more because you're not going to have so much cost related to managing those sites with a full-time or even part-time employee having to roll a truck there. You're also going to be able to potentially manage more sites. So you're going to be able to create more revenue for your business being able to leverage some of these remote capabilities, once again, without having to have that employee go site to site. So when we look at this, you know, kind of generically, you know, the more we can leverage technology to do a lot of what we used to do 10, 20, 30 years ago on site, uh, the more valuable those service contracts will be and the more systems you're going to be able to manage. So it's not new for a controller to be able to hook into the internet, but What has always been an issue is now the communication you have to have with the customer. So one, you either hook an Ethernet cable up to it, and now you've got to go through their network, and they're never happy about that. And now IT gets involved, and you've got to figure out all these security protocols. And uh, I believe that's actually how Target got hacked. It was an HVAC company, I think. Yep, through their HVAC system, they were able to access you know, all the credit cards, employee information. And so it's really just uh, identity theft that that's happening, coming through a, a secondary system by piggybacking on their local network. So a lot of people are just saying, no, you cannot get on my local network. And now that means we can't monitor this device. And then others are saying, okay, well, maybe we can have a cell phone plan for the controller. Let's talk about each one of those. How should we be having this conversation with our customers to make sure they're getting, one, the best information from us, and it allows us to get that information from the machine so we don't have to roll trucks, as you say? Yeah, exactly. And and we're seeing this, you know, throughout all the different markets that we manage connections. We have about 500,000 connections that we manage uh, through Verizon and AT&T. And like I said before, about 32 markets that we're in right now. Some markets have adapted very quickly to this in in years ago, Um, but we're seeing it, like you mentioned, with Target, uh, any of the big box chains now, they say, great, you can have a water treatment controller or any type of equipment on our site and remotely monitor it, but you're not using our network anymore. You have to bring your own network to the game. Uh, and, And I think we're seeing this starting to happen, maybe not as quickly as we've witnessed in other markets, but we're starting to see it in water treatment. And so really, there's a couple of different ways to access the internet, as I mentioned before. It's either through local available network uh, on-premise through Ethernet or through that location's Wi-Fi or to bring your own private connection via cellular. Uh, and so when we started adopting you know, internet and controllers you know, years ago, this isn't something new like you had mentioned. 
those types of networks were much more readily available. The idea of, well, the network's already there. I can hook up to Ethernet. I can hook up to Wi-Fi. It's quote unquote free. We're not seeing that anymore. If a location was allowing you to do that, they're saying, hey, you've got to get off our network and you've got to figure this out. And so cellular becomes you know, the easiest, most reliable, cost-effective and secure way of bringing that own private connection to a site that you don't own, but your equipment has to be there. You have to operate it and you need to leverage those remote capabilities. With that, you're also talking about IT departments. You mentioned that you know previously. So let's say you have a hundred sites that you manage and you're currently using either their ethernet or their Wi-Fi. You've just inherited 100 IT departments <laughs> with varying levels of capability and customer service. And so now they're in charge of your network that keeps your equipment online. Inevitably, there's going to be a problem. You're going to have to roll a truck to that site to try to fix it yourself, or you're spending countless hours on the phone trying to work with their IT department, figuring out what the problem is and how to bring it back online. And so as we move forward and when we dive deeper into the Internet of Things, it's just not the most economically cost effective or reliable way anymore to connect to the Internet because you're having to rely on other people to manage your connection that you need to maintain your service contracts or, or maintain your equipment on site. So if we decide that we're going to move from connecting to the the local network that's there to a cellular device, does that mean a brand new controller? Is it just plug and play and what we already have? What equipment do we need? Yeah, typically it does not require a, a new controller. I say that with you know a grain of salt. It depends on how old that equipment is on site. Uh, but typically, you know, all of the major controller manufacturers now provide different ways for their end users to connect. And so they have the ability to either plug in Ethernet, use Wi-Fi, or utilize a cellular uh, device. Most plug and play cellular routers, they require an Ethernet connection. So you're actually creating a hardwired connection via standard RJ45 Ethernet cable from the cellular router into the controller. Most of the controller manufacturers have that present already kind of as a base on their on their equipment. Some in other markets, uh, it's an add-on module that you purchase, uh, but it's available and it's easy to do. So typically, as long as you have that Ethernet-based connection, you're going to be able to plug in a third-party cellular device and bring that own private secure connection to your sites. Just last week, we had an issue with one of the controllers we had online. It was hooked up to their re remote internet service. And they decided that they didn't need the port opened anymore that they had opened for us probably about 10 years ago. They didn't know why they did that. And then it just stopped working. So stuff like that has to happen all the time. Yeah, all the time. Uh, and, and so having different port forwarding commands, you know, different firewalls locally, uh, we'll get this all the time too, where, hey, I've been using you know, my, the ethernet available on a site and all of a sudden I can't connect it anymore. Well, the, the local site changed their permissions, their IT department changed their security protocol. And so that's something that happens all the time as well is you've connected one way for a long period of time, but then that, that local enterprise, that business changed how their connection is set up. And so now all of the equipment that you have has to be reconfigured and provisioned again. And so, you know, all of this just leads to, you know, time, which equals money. So the more time we're having to spend configuring this, being on site to troubleshoot, the less money you're going to be able to make or, or get upside down potentially in some of these service contracts. It, it's not always hours that you can bill for. So being able to provide your own connection, being able to manage that connection or have a partner say like OpConnect that is even better, that helps you manage that connection, allows you to focus on what you do best and you don't necessarily need to be a tech wizard or IT professional. So walk us through that process. Say we're talking about this customer that just we had the issue last week and we decided, you know what, we're just going to have a cell contract and we're going to manage that ourselves. We're going to take them out of the equation. What do we now need to do? We'll get something shipped to us. How do we install it? How do we set it up? What does that look like? So there's a couple of different ways that you can deploy cellular. The one that's probably most common 
that we've seen in the industry and other industries is to just go out and do it yourself. So you are you know, acquiring and purchasing your own third-party cellular device. You're then working with a carrier or a MVNO, which is basically just reselling services, and you're contracting with them and in, in buying data and kind of chopping that data plan up across your portfolio of devices now. With that, you know, you're in charge of your own troubleshooting, your activations, your provisioning. Like I said, if there's different port forwarding commands or security features that you need to enable to allow that communication, you're kind of doing it all on your own. You're doing it yourself. And that might be very feasible if you have a limited number of connections. Uh, there's other companies out there like OpConnect that provide a managed service. So they're doing that for you. And so you would simply just call them up and order a device. They're going to have the hardware. Uh, they're going to activate it. They're going to provision it for you. If you're on site and you're having issues, they're going to have uh, tech support that you can then call in. So once again, you, you don't have to become that local expert. You know, hey, I've, I've moved away from the Ethernet that's available on site, but now I'm having to manage my own cellular solution and do it myself. And that can be that can be cumbersome, especially when we get into some of these larger organizations that have hundreds or thousands of sites that they manage. It's taking you out of your your main role. You're a water treatment service provider or company. You're not necessarily a cellular internet provider. So possibly looking at a managed service company allows you to leverage, you know, professionals within that that company leverage their knowledge, their expertise, and that allows you to do what you do best and focus on your, your main business and not managing and maintaining a cellular network. So if I now have the device, the controller hooked up, we have a cellular plan, I'm still going to the controller manufacturer's webpage or whatever they had set up for me to access it. What you're talking about is if I have a hundred systems out there, I can see at a glance everything that's going on, whether they're online or not, if there are any issues. And if I have any questions, I don't need to dig that up. It's all on one, one site. Exactly. And so, yes, you are leveraging the platform, the app, the web page that the OEM controller manufacturer has. That's going to be your remote management site for all of your controllers. If you're leveraging technology like OpConnect has with managed services, we're going to provide a dashboard called Summit that's going to take a deeper dive into all of the cellular analytics of each individual device. So you can look at it from your account on a whole. How many devices do I have? How many are online? How many are offline? And then you can you know, dial into an individual device and see how that device is interacting, You know, providing numbers for signal strength, signal quality, data consumption, location, IP addresses, some of this information that's not always readily available from the OEM's platform. They're really good at designing the platform to manage their equipment, but not necessarily giving you that deep dive into the wireless connection. One of the issues I'm sure everybody's had is something's working great and then we lose a signal. And let's face it, we put these things in the basement and all sorts of places that aren't great for signals. What do we do about that? Yeah, and so there's a couple of different things that we can talk about here. There is new technology that's out, especially when we're looking at cellular technology, that really lends itself well to markets like water treatment, where you have controllers in basement operations or in congested city environments. And then there's also the conversation of, you know, is this the best site to use cellular? And obviously, I work for a company that, you know, manages cellular connections, and a lot of times that works, but there's absolutely sites where, you know, cellular is not your best solution. And so while we've talked about possibly having, you know, moving away from Ethernet, it's not avoidable sometimes. Sometimes you're in super remote areas where you're 20, 30 miles from a cell tower in the mountains, et cetera, and you just can't get a cell signal out there. And so you may be forced to leverage, you know, that local available Ethernet or Wi-Fi on premise. There was a site that we were working on in, in irrigation, different market, but very similar in, to, in terms of machine-to-machine -machine communications, IoT, leveraging control panels for you know, remote monitoring. We were working on the border station in San Diego and talk about just a ton of congestion with different wireless technology and being on the border of the USA and Mexico and trying to get cellular to work. And, and we got it to work. 
but it wasn't consistent. We weren't providing, you know, what I felt was a good value to our customer. And I was very straightforward and said, hey, you know, we can keep going at this and, and try leveraging different signal boosters and antennas. But this may be that, you know, one time out of 10 or 99.9% chance, you know, where cellular doesn't work well and we need to kind of leverage other technology. So you just mentioned signal boosting and antennas. So we've got that controller that's in the bottom of the building, in the sub-basement. There's no cell phone signal there. But if we can get it outside, we can get a cell signal. How do we do that since we obviously can't move the controller? Yeah. So one of the things that we typically like to do is move the cellular device with the antenna. So the longer the antenna lead is that connects to the cellular device, uh, you actually get a degradation in signal quality. There's very little to no degradation in signal quality or strength with a longer ethernet cable. So if we have the ability to run 100, 200, 300 foot ethernet cable even, uh, we can move the device and the antenna to a location that maybe has a better signal strength. There's also new technology that we can leverage. And so something that, you know, the listeners out there may or may not be aware of is CAT M1 technology or LTE M. And so this is considered new 5G technology. What's really cool about it is it actually works on both 4G and 5G carriers and their antennas. And so basically we're kind of future proof right now in terms of providing technology You know, if 4G sunsets like we just saw with 3G, which I'm sure a lot of people out there have had headaches with trying to get their 3G devices uh, to get back online with new equipment, we're kind of in this sweet spot of, okay, you know, if we get eight or 10 years, probably more out of 4G, we're going to get, you know, at least 15 years out of the current 5G infrastructure. And so deploying Cat M1 right now will probably outlive the controller that it's hooking up to. And so when the carriers came out with CAT M1 or LTE M, they took a look at the internet of things and some of these machine to machine M to M communications and said, hey, not everything out there needs this super high speed, high bandwidth type of signal to communicate. Obviously we have a lot of those now with security, video cameras and and streaming, but controllers and water and wastewater are low bandwidth, their low data. And so they recognized that and said, okay, let's create this new low bandwidth, lower frequency technology called CAT M1. And let's move all of these machine communications down from this high bandwidth, high frequency, high speed that our cell phones and stuff are on and put it in this dedicated band. And so really what we're able to do is is leverage lower frequency. And so if you think just kind of in terms of, of frequency, the lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength is, you know, the further away it will work from its, uh, you know, origination point. So a cell tower and the more penetration strength it has. So you keep mentioning, you know, these controllers are in the basement building operations room. Cat M1 technology has about three times the building penetration strength of regular 4G or even that high speed 5G on your cell phone. So if you're in the basement and you don't have a signal on your cell phone, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's technology out there that still won't work. And so we have really been pushing this CAT M1 technology at OpConnect. We have a product called the Milo Dura that utilizes CAT M1 technology with Verizon and AT&T. And I would say 99% plus, uh, we're able to plug and play that technology in a location that has had unreliable technology or quote unquote, their cell phone doesn't work. That sounds fantastic. Everybody listening to this is probably wondering if this is a service contract, they're going to have to eat the cost. How do they prove an ROI now that they're going to have to buy not only the equipment, but they're also going to have to pay for a cell plan? Yeah, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. The most common way is is a more typical CapEx type of plan where you're purchasing outright the hardware and obviously, you know, you're going to have a, a multi-year return on investment from the, you know, acquisition cost of hardware. There's also OpEx pricing out there as well. So once again, OpConnect provides both. And so customers can actually rent the hardware from us. 
Uh, so think of it almost like Comcast cable versus DirecTV. DirecTV, you have to purchase everything. Comcast cable or whoever your local cable provider, you know, they are also a managed service. You're typically renting the hardware from them. Uh, and there are certain advantages to that. So the first one is you don't have this huge capital equipment cost up front. You're able to have a lower kind of monthly bill that you can just roll in to your service contract. But yes, it is going to be a cost that maybe is not currently baked in if you're not wirelessly or remotely connecting, or if you've been leveraging a local network via Wi-Fi or Ethernet. Cellular costs have come way down. Uh, this was one of the you know kind of impacts or or reasons why years ago uh, there wasn't as much widespread cellular adoption is it was expensive, but data plans costs have come way down, uh, especially when we look at lower data controllers like water treatment controllers. Typically, you're using 50 to 250 megabytes of data a month, which is very very low, uh, and so the cost for that sometimes can range anywhere from you know 10 to 20 bucks a month. So it's not a huge cost that has to be baked in, but it's definitely something that you know we encourage our customers to say, hey, this is no longer an option anymore. I can't provide this same level of service by rolling a truck out daily, weekly, monthly. And that cost now is going to go up. So when we look at costs of rolling a truck, you know, on a daily, monthly type of uh, or weekly frequency versus the cost, uh, fixed cost of having a cellular data plan, the cost of a data plan is going to be much less than, you know, the overhead of uh, having to pay that employee windshield time and costs of rolling a truck. What that ROI is, uh, is always a magical number. Uh, we do have an ROI calculator that we can plug in, you know, a bunch of data to and kind of leverage that to give a rough idea. Uh, but it really depends too on you know what the cost is. The cost of New York City versus Salt Lake is going to be much higher to roll a truck or to deploy services. So there's a lot of different factors. It's hard to come up with you know a, a generic ROI, but happy to engage kind of on a one-on-one -on -one level to help understand what those costs are. What's one of your biggest success stories in the water treatment industry? Yeah, so we're fairly new to the water treatment industry. So about two years ago, we started looking at other markets. So kind of a quick history of OpConnect. We started in the early 2000s. Uh, we were provisioning, you know, old dinosaur 3G telecom routers and hooking them up to ATMs. Way back then, an ATM at a 7-Eleven or a gas station was on a landline. Uh, so it was on an old phone line and they said, hey, you can't be on our phone line anymore. And so all these ATM deployers had to figure out how am I going to deploy my ATM at this location without using, you know, the gas station or the 7-Eleven's phone service anymore. And so we started doing that as an option to connect under a different company. And then in 2009, the option to connect outgrew the parent company that was an ATM service provider. Uh, and we became OpConnect. We then quickly started, you know, kind of diving into other commercial retail transactional markets uh, that require payment for their equipment to to work. So, you know, uptime reliability has always been paramount with OpConnect. And so we're kind of built on the financial markets with uptime and security, but we're able to push those in the newer markets like water treatment. So like I've said, we've only been in the, in the water treatment industry for about two years. Uh, we have a couple of large service providers that we've been working with that, you know, in a matter of a year have converted you know, several hundred, 300 plus devices uh, in the field. And so that's been a great success. And really, a lot of these have been in major, you know, large cities that we talked about, like Chicago, New York City, where it just is not economically viable to roll a truck. Uh, and I also think COVID had a lot to do with that. Hey, you're not allowed on premise anymore. Well, how am I going to do this? How am I going to provide my customers the value that they need if I can't even have an employee on site. So COVID actually helped quite a bit, pull the adoption curve over in water treatment and other markets. But yeah, we had tons of systems that weren't able to connect in downtown locations in New York City because the, you know, the 4G cellular service just could not penetrate the building. There's also congestion. So when I talked about CAT M1 being on a different band, a different frequency, you know, we're operating in a lower threshold where all the cell phones say in New York City are. So we just have congestion that we're dealing with. It might not even be building penetration, 
but it might just be there's so many wireless devices that are trying to connect to the network at once that these devices aren't getting priority. So simply putting them, you know, moving them from a standard 4G LTE connection, uh, which is, you know, definitely the base standard right now in a lot of markets and putting them into this newer CATAM1 technology has alleviated both of those pain points. Not having to deal with congestion in a city environment and then being able to get that cell signal into an environment where traditionally you can't get it. As you were meeting with members of AWT in Vancouver, what was some of the feedback that you were getting? What were some of the concerns, some of the questions? Yeah, we had we had a great show. It was our first time, like I said, uh, exhibiting at AWT, and we had a lot of just water treaters from you know all over the country, you know, in the U.S. and even Canada. Because it obviously was in Vancouver, I think we got a good a good amount of Canadian professionals there as well. And, you know, the biggest problem and pain point that we heard was, you know, unreliable cell signal and not having necessarily, you know, the tech support to be able to to support devices. So if they're doing it themselves or or working with just a provider that provides hardware and then activation, well, what happens when that doesn't work on the back end? And so as I've kind of stated, you know, throughout our conversation today, we've done a lot with provisioning our technology and having that back end customer support to alleviate just a lot of the common pain points of single carrier connectivity. It's either Verizon or AT&T. You know, our devices are on both and they automatically switch carriers based on signal quality. So it's, it's, we're leveraging IoT. We're, we're leveraging autonomous behavior of our devices on premise. So you don't have to do anything or, or you don't have to know which provider you need, you know, does a water treater have the tools to understand if they need Verizon or AT&T? Probably not. But really, it's the customer service. If and when something fails, whether it's hardware or carrier related, is there you know, a customer support agent, a tech support service that's going to be able to troubleshoot so you're not having to spend your time doing that? Uh, those were really two of the biggest pain points that we heard in really getting kicked off that local network. Hey, I just got kicked off. What do I do? You know, How do I do this? Uh, well, let us help you do that. If you could only get one point across today, what do you want that point to be? Yeah. So the one thing that I would want to get across is is just leveraging the internet, leveraging technology that's available, whether it's, you know, local with Ethernet or Wi-Fi or bringing your own private connection like cellular, leveraging the technology and bringing that adoption curve forward. You know, in other markets, we see near 100 percent adoption of wireless or on-premise connectivity. It doesn't always have to be cellular. It doesn't have to be Wi-Fi. But we've seen almost near uh, 100% adoption of service providers, OEMs, whoever is deploying the technology, having the monitoring capabilities, not having the roll truck. So yeah, I can't I can't stress it enough for you know the AWT members out there, or the water treaters in general, to to look at technology. And if you don't understand it, reach out to companies like OpConnect or other companies that this is all we do. And, you know, let us partner with you on that so we can help provide the best technological solution for your controller and for your company. And if someone does want to reach out to you, how should they do that? Yeah, so uh, happy to provide my contact information. But the the easiest way is we have on our website, www.opconnect.com. There's a little orange box on the top right that says contact us. You can put in your information. Uh, There's a note section where you can add a message. You can say, hey. You know, I heard you on the Scaling Up podcast or uh, met you at AWT or I have a water treatment controller. Uh, And then also on the bottom right, we have kind of a live chat. You'll see my colleague, Rob Ramage, uh, his portrait there. You can actually live chat with Rob and he'll answer any basic questions you have. Or once again, say, hey, I heard you on the podcast. How do I, you know, learn more about this? And either, you know, our inside team or Rob will get me connected with you. Awesome. And we will put all that information on our show notes page to make that easy as well. Well, thanks for sharing all this information with us. I've got a few lightning round questions before we say goodbye. Are you ready for those? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So if you could go back to your very first day doing what you're doing right now, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So th- what I'm doing now... I it's totally different than what I spent the majority of my career in. So, you know, as I say before, you know, I spent 20 plus years in kind of on the OEM side, designing and managing, you know, wastewater and stormwater treatment systems. And so 
I think I got in my own head a little bit. Oh my gosh, I'm now talking about this different technology and IoT. Uh, and I, I felt like I had to be this expert in IoT, but really, you know, I think the reason that we're having success uh, in some of these connected water markets is, you know, the experience that I had the 20 years before understanding what the users are going through. I had issues connecting technology 15 years ago when cellular wasn't as uh, prevalent, trying to figure out how we're going to remote manage some of this stuff. Hey, w- phone lines are expensive. How are we going to do this now? And so if I was able to go back two years from now and, and say, hey, Justin, you know, don't get so bogged down in kind of the details of IoT, you know, leverage your knowledge, your connections, leverage the, the professionals that I work with to help fill in the blanks. I, I probably wouldn't have been as stressed out <laughs> those first couple of months. <laughs> what are some of your favorite books? Yeah, so I read a lot of um, blogs now. Uh, I'm not reading as many books, so reading a lot of blogs about different you know industries, trying to learn more and more about the industries that we're connecting to, and and learning more and more about the equipment that we're trying to connect to to become a little bit more of an industry expert on what our customers do and not just on what we do. Uh, but one of the last books we read, uh, we actually read it as a sales organization at OpConnect, and it's called The Power of Moments. Uh, and it talks about all these different experiences, you know, that aren't even close to what we do, you know, at OpConnect on a day in and day out basis. But it's really understanding the customer experience. And if you can understand the customer experience, you're going to be able to provide more value to that person or that enterprise. So good read if you haven't read it before. Hollywood's always listening to the Scaling Up H2O podcast to figure out what the next big movie is going to be. So when they hear this, who do you want playing Justin? Uh, that's an easy one. I'm going to go with my man, Ryan Reynolds. I think he's hilarious. We're about the same age. So yeah, I'd go Ryan Reynolds on that. We'll, we'll add a little bit of comedy into the water treatment world. And he owns a cellular company, doesn't he? He does. Yeah, he does. So I think that's perfect. We're connecting all the dots. There you go. <laughs> my last question, if you had the power to talk to anybody throughout history, who would it be with and why? This is going to sound really corny. But I would probably go with my father in the late 80s. So back in like 1987, he kind of went off on his own and developed a new product for on-site wastewater leach field technology. And I think it would just be really awesome to go back when he was having those first conversations and, you know, talking to, you know, customers and contractors that were having all these pain points to, to be a part of that conversation and understand his process better on, you know, how he basically developed what's become the standard in leach field technology. I think that would be pretty cool. So I'm going to give a shout out to the old man there. Well, Justin, I want to thank you for coming on the Scaling Up H2O podcast, sharing your knowledge with us and probably saving a lot of travel time in a lot of water treaters lives. Yes, absolutely. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, Thanks for having me and, and looking forward to connecting to everyone next year at AWT. Justin, thank you for all of that information. Nation, let's face it, as we get more clients, as we get busier, and as technology becomes better, we are able to do so much more for our customers without actually being at our customers' locations. So there is just so much that you can do now with remote monitoring, and there's so many tools out there that make that monitoring so much easier so you can get more done and you're more prepared when you get on your customer's site. So all that valuable time you spend is spent on the right thing. So we try to bring shows like this to you so you can continue to expand all the knowledge you have about technology. So thank you so much for introducing Justin to me. This, of course, came from a Scaling Up Nation member. And that's how we get so many ideas. That's how we get so many guests that you out there in the Scaling Up Nation let my great team here at Scaling Up H2O know who you want me to interview, what shows you want me to write, what questions you have. So thank you so much for that. Also, since I'm into thanking, I'm going to thank James McDonald for making us a little bit smarter each and every week. So here is a brand new installment of Periodic Water Table with James. 
Hello and welcome to the Periodic Water Table with James, where we think and learn about water chemistry drop by drop. Please use your week to search online, ask your colleagues, or even pick up a book to learn more about each week's periodic water table topic. If you do, at the end of the year, you'll be 52 water chemistry smarter. So let's raise the water table of knowledge together and get started. Today's topic is... Alkalinity. Alkalinity is an important concept to learn. It can be both simple and complex at times. What is the definition of alkalinity? What chemical species can make up alkalinity? Are pH and alkalinity the same or different? How are they related? What is a dissociation curve in regards to various forms of alkalinity versus pH? How does the level of alkalinity impact the solubility of other chemical elements? How is the p-alkalinity test different from the m-alkalinity test or total alkalinity? What units are used to express these test results? Do you test the OH alkalinity or do you calculate it or both? What chemical species are typically represented by each of these tests? What can interfere with an alkalinity test? Remember, knowledge is power, and taking the time to learn more about water chemistry each week will help make you a force to be reckoned with. Be sure to post what you learn to social media and tag it with hashtag WaterTable23 and hashtag ScalingUpH2O. I look forward to learning more from you. Well, thank you, James. You know, phosphate is one of those things that is really tricky for industrial water treaters to grasp. And I did an episode way, way back in 2018. It was episode 46 and was all about phosphate testing. And I did a Mythbusters style phosphate uh, stary pin test. I think I even talked about the different types of phosphate, but I'm thinking it's probably overdue for me to talk about phosphate again. So stay tuned as I bring you another episode of phosphate. I've had a lot of people ask me about that, so um, that is on the list. Like I said, we figure out what we are going to talk about because we talk with all of you. So thanks again for going to scalinguph2o.com and going over to our show ideas page, or you can leave us a voicemail with what your idea is, or you can ask me a question that I might answer on the air. Nation, I want to thank you for listening to Scaling Up H2O, of course, the best, the favorite podcast for the industrial water treatment community. Of course, you are part of the Scaling Up Nation, and I will have a brand new episode for you next Friday. We try to do that each and every Friday, so you have a new episode each and every week. Nation, I hope you have a great week and take care of each other. Why do we call our mastermind the Rising Tide Mastermind? Well, I know you've heard me say before, a rising tide raises all ships. That's one of my favorite quotes because it's so true. The better we do, the better somebody else can do and vice versa. That's exactly what the Rising Tide Mastermind is. It's our members helping other members to achieve success and to get there further and faster. To find out more about the Rising Tide Mastermind, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind.